I was 23 years old where, uh, when I learned something new about Christian weddings. Um, before that time, I hadn't really been to very many weddings in my life. I'd been to a few, and most of the weddings I'd been to, if I'm honest, I didn't pay a lot of attention to the wedding ceremony. It was just a bunch of talking. I didn't listen to a lot of it. So most of my education on weddings came from TV. It came from the movies. And uh, as you probably have noticed, all TV or movie weddings are basically the same. They last about 90 seconds. There's always some big, you know, suspenseful, uh, scandalous interruption. Um, but the one thing they all have in common is eventually the characters, the people getting married say, I do. So I was, I was 23 and uh, it came as a total surprise to me as I was sitting there with Jocelyn and our pastor who was gonna do our wedding service and we were planning our wedding ser uh, service uh, and he informed me that we would not be saying the words, I do on our wedding day. Which I was like, wait a minute, that's the only part of the wedding service I actually know is that you're supposed to say, I do. Instead, he informed me that we would not be saying, I do, we'd be saying, I will. And at first, that sounded weird to me. I'm like, I will? That doesn't sound right. That's not, that's not how it's supposed to go. But he made a pretty compelling case. Uh, he explained, that, hey, it's, it's not, do you, Dion, in this moment, take this woman to be your wife? But the real question is, will you, in an ongoing way, have her to be your wife? See, see, I do is, is maybe a momentary thing. I will is an ongoing statement of intention or volition. It is an ongoing commitment. Now, and as he shared that, I, I, I thought, oh gosh, that, that really makes sense. I will, even though no one says it on TV, is so much better than I do. And if you think about it, most of the, the, the most powerful promises in the world are not I do promises. They are I will promises. You know, do you love me? I do. Of course I do. That pales in comparison to will you love me? forever will you fight for me will you be here for me and to hear someone say back to us i will that's way better than i do isn't it uh, there's even some of you might know this there's even an old beatles song uh, paul mccartney song i think uh, uh that he wrote called i will does anyone know that song a couple of you do at home, I don't see your hands raised. I can see you. No, I can't. Um, but uh, I, my, my dad used to sing uh, that that song. I will. And then I started singing it to my kids. It was part of our bedtime kind of playlist. All these different songs that I would sometimes sing to my kids. And I will was a favorite. And uh, and and I never really put together why I loved it so much, except um, except it kind of I think spoke about this ongoing, enduring, committed, intentional, volitional promise. To, to love. Uh, the song goes like this. Who knows how long I've loved you? You know I love you still. Would I wait a lonely lifetime? If you want me to, I will. And then the chorus goes, I love you forever and forever. Love you with all my heart. Love you whenever we're together. Love you when we're apart. And I would sing that song over my kids and, uh, and, and just like embracing this reality. that It was true. As a dad, I'm, I'm going to love these kids forever. And I wanted them to know that. And, and there, something really special happened my last birthday. Um, my, uh, my oldest daughter, she... I, I, they never know what to get me for my birthdays. And so um, I was just like, hey, just you know, write me a nice card. I'm a words of affirmation guy. And so she, she, uh, she sat me down in the living room and she played that song on the piano and sang it back to me. And she's going off to college this year, so I'm a total sap, so I was just a puddle. I was just like, oh my gosh. Because I will promises, you know this is true, I will promises are the most powerful promises, the most enduring promises. They're way better than I do promises. And this series is all about the I will promises that God makes to us. These are not I do promises. These are not momentary, time sensitive promises. These are ongoing, enduring, intentional, committed promises that go on forever. In all of these promises, God began to fulfill, and he's still keeping them, but he began to fulfill them in the person of Jesus when Jesus came onto the scene. 
Uh, but I have to tell you that today's promise may not be the most comforting promise for you. The promise we're going to look at today, because today's promise is a promise that God makes, a promise to rule forever. Huh. Now, now the reason I say that, to rule forever, I say, huh, is because those of us, at least in this culture, have been taught to distrust or to be a little concerned about people who make these kinds of promises. After all, ours is a system where we have divided powers. We have three branches of government. Within those branches of government, there are checks and balances. We've been taught that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts yeah, absolutely, right? So we've been taught to distrust this kind of power or these kinds of claims to rule forever. We prefer a system where every two or four or six years, we get a chance to make a change. We get, we get a chance to vote someone in or out. These kinds of promises can make people like us a little uncomfortable because forever is a mighty long time, isn't it? <laughs> and what if we want to make a change? So, yeah, sure, in political terms, this promise may make us a little uncomfortable. It's nothing short of, of tyranny. It's a dangerous idea. But here's, here's the thing. Today we're talking about a different kind of ruler, a different kind of king. Uh, last week, if you were with us, John Shepard, I mean, none of us were here, we were all there. Um, so John Shepard talked to you about a promise that God made through the prophet Isaiah, and he shared with you a little bit more about Isaiah's world to help you understand the context of that promise. By the way, he did a great job, didn't he? Um, yeah, yeah, way to go, John. And uh, man, our, our middle school and high school students are so blessed to have John Shepard and Pua Parker um, leading them. I, I feel grateful that we have such great staff here. Um, I wanna take a moment this week to share with you a little bit more about Zechariah the guy that we're gonna look at today, the, the guy through whom God delivers this promise to rule forever. And I want you to understand a little bit more about what was going on in his world. So Zechariah was living about 150 years after Isaiah. So that means that while Isaiah, if you were here last week, Isaiah was forewarning God's people that some hard times were coming, some times of disaster where they'd be carried off into exile and their city and their nation would be destroyed. Isaiah was forewarning, now 150 years later, Zechariah's writing after, after the worst of it is now over. And what has changed is the geopolitical landscape has changed. So in Isaiah's day, Babel, Babylon, Babylonian Empire is the big empire of the day. Nebuchadnezzar takes over this part of the world, including Jerusalem and, and this narrow section right here, which is basically Israel. That's the part of the Babylon, uh, the Babylonian Empire. In Zechariah's day, something new has happened. There's been a new global superpower that has come onto the scene, and that is the Medio or Medo-Persian Empire. A, a little bit more about who they are. Take a look. The Persians were part of a larger migratory group called the Iranians, who moved into modern Iran from southern Russia and central Europe around 1000 BCE. The Persians and other Iranian groups eventually formed tribal societies, and began expanding their rule over local nomadic tribes. In 550 BCE, Cyrus the Great, the leader of the Persians, conquered the Medes and united the Iranian people under one ruler for the first time. Cyrus became the first king of the Persian Empire and went on to establish one of the largest empires in the world. After unifying the Persians under one ruler, Cyrus and his army set out to win control of the western portion of Iran. This included several trade routes that crossed Iran and continued through Anatolia, modern western Turkey. In addition, Cyrus conquered the nomadic tribes who lived in the eastern section of Iran. With the perimeters of his territory secure and the income from the trade routes that he now controlled in western Iran, Cyrus and his generals expanded farther and farther into the lands that neighbored Persia. Cyrus and his generals quickly conquered the kingdom of Lydia and Greek cities along the coast of Anatolia, thus gaining access to seaports on the Mediterranean. Unlike many conquerors, Cyrus was a gentle invader. When he conquered the kingdom of Lydia, Cyrus spared the life of the king, Croesus, and Croesus became one of Cyrus's most valued friends and advisors. Cyrus developed a reputation as a kind and merciful leader to those that he conquered. 
Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> but Cyrus didn't stop where the map uh, showed you, where, where we stopped that video. Um, he actually then pushed down and took over all of the lands that used to belong to Babylon, which included Israel, which included Jerusalem, the, the capital of, of Israel. He took all that land on. But Cyrus, as you heard, was a different kind of emperor. He ruled his empire in a different way. And so, in, so instead of, instead of you know, tearing down people's cities and scattering them, Cyrus allowed people to return home, including the Israelites. He allowed them re to return home to begin rebuilding their city. So Zechariah is writing during, during this time, and it's a more hopeful time now. They're rebuilding. Now, rebuilding can be overwhelming, but it's still kind of exciting. And although they are returned to their homeland and, and things are exciting, um, they're still not exactly free, though, either. And so it's in this time that Zechariah wrote his prophecies, and it's during this time that Zechariah, God used Zechariah to deliver a very important promise, a very timely promise to his people. While things were looking better, but they weren't quite out of the woods yet. We're going to look at it in Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. Now, these are just kind of poetic titles for the, for the Israelites. So God's saying, hey, hey, my people, rejoice, shout, and here's why. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. This is important. Your king comes to you. This means that Israel, again, is going to is going to be led by their own king. They're going to have a king again from their own people. And he's going to be righteous, not like, not like Nebuchadnezzar, not like Cyrus, these people who, who don't worship the true God. They're not on the right side. This is going to be someone who worships the true God. And unlike the recent Israelite kings, this king is going to be victorious. He's, he's going to be mighty in battle. He's not going to get his butt kicked by all of these foreign generals and, and, and emperors and kings, he's going to be a victorious king. This, this is great news for a nation who's still living under the occupation of a foreign empire. God's saying a day is coming where you will rejoice and shout because you're going to have a king again and he will be righteous and he will be powerful. He will be, be victorious. And then he goes on and he says, and he will come lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. <laughs> what? Right? This is where things get weird. This is not what you expect. That, that this, this righteous king, this, this, this powerful warrior who rides into town smelling of victory, comes riding into town on a donkey? <laughs> really? A donkey? Right, that's the best I can do, right? A donkey, not just any donkey, but a teeny tiny donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Picture this, a powerful man, you know, a conqueror, a warrior, riding in on a little bitty donkey. You're just like, wait, what? It's confusing. It, it doesn't fit. It's, it's incongruent. It's embarrassing. And then Zechariah goes on. And it, uh, God says this through Zechariah, I will, right? I will, I will. These are the promises we're looking at. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and, and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow, battle bow will be broken. So all this really powerful language, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. But the problem is Ephraim and Jerusalem, these are referring to the Israelite people. So God's saying, I'm gonna take away the chariots and the war horses and the weapons from my own people. That, that's dangerous talk, right? That's, that's kind of talk we don't like to hear from our leaders. And then he goes on. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. See, see, what this king is coming to do is not just to disarm his people. The reason he can disarm his people is because he's going to bring peace. He's going to establish peace, not just to the, the lands within his boundaries, but to every nation, to every people. He's not going to leave his people vulnerable, but instead he's going to bring peace to all nations as far as the eye can see, and he will rule forever. Now, this is a really big promise, especially given the moment that the Israelites were living in because they have no king. They're not even a nation. They have a broken down capital city. 
They've got no military. They've got no temple. And yet God, their God, makes this promise. He says, I will establish peace. I will send you a king. And he will rule forever over everything as far as the eye can see. Now, if you're a student of history, here's what you probably know, that technically speaking, politically speaking, this promise was never fulfilled. Israel never became an empire. After the Persians, well then it was the Greeks, a guy by the name of Alexander the Great, you've heard of him. And then after the Greeks, the Romans, Julius Caesar and all the Caesars that came after. I mean, empire after empire after empire, not one of them was Israel. Not only that, Israel, after this promise, never again became a sovereign nation, not until 1948, after World War II, as a part of a treaty when the UN created Israel as a sovereign nation again. I want you to be clear on something. Politically speaking, this prophecy was never fulfilled. And I want to take that a step further. It never will be fulfilled because it's not a political prophecy. See, this is a prophecy about a different kind of king inaugurating a different kind of kingdom than anything Israel had ever known. And, and if we can get that in our minds, if we can understand that rightly, if, if we can look at this prophecy not through a political lens, then here's what we'll see, that in fact this prophecy was fulfilled. And God is keeping his promise still. I, I want to tell you about the day that this prophecy was fulfilled. It was right around 30 AD, maybe, maybe up to 36 AD, somewhere in that six year time span. And it was right before the Jewish celebration, the annual celebration of Passover, a big deal in Jewish culture. And one day in the week leading up to the celebration of the Passover, this, this popular nomadic rabbi, a guy who was only about 30 years old, came riding into Jerusalem. And he came with his band of uneducated teenage disciples, not, not an army, not a great imperial guard. And sure enough, he came riding into town, not on a war horse, not in a chariot, but on a donkey, on a little donkey, on, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And yet there were all kinds of people, in spite of how, how unimpressive this was, there were all kinds of people who lined the streets as he came into the town. And they were cheering for him because, because as they saw him there on that little donkey, they remember the words of Zechariah and they thought, oh, this is it. It's happening. We're going to have a king again. And this time it wasn't, it wasn't Persia who was in charge. It wasn't Greece. It was Rome. They were occupied by Rome. And they thought, here is our moment. He's doing it. Now is the time for him to take the throne, to get rid of these foreign powers, to extend our borders from sea to shining sea. There will be peace. And so they line the streets and they cut down palm branches and they wave them in the air and they shout, Hosanna to the son of David. That means save us son of David, and David was the greatest king in Israel's history, and so th this was a proclamation of, hey, right now we get it, we see it, we understand this prophecy is being fulfilled. A king in the line of David, like David, this great king, he's coming to save us. And the people kept yelling and waving their palm branches, and, 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 and this rabbi named Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem and everyone is so excited. The people, they are ready to march with him straight to the palace to overthrow the governor Pilate who's in town for the Pass Passover, the puppet king Herod. They're ready to overthrow all of, these, all of these leaders and to establish him as their king. But then Jesus does something strange. As he's riding into town on this donkey, he doesn't go to the palace. Instead, he goes to the temple. And he flips over some tables and he yells at some people and he drives out some money changers. And then he goes back out of town to the boonies, to the outskirts where he hides out. And everyone is so confused. What on earth is going on? Because he came and his coup didn't happen in the palace. It happened in the temple. And everyone's thinking, wait a minute, this is not how you establish an empire. This is not how you become the king. This is not the way you do it. And that's because they don't understand 
that Jesus came to be a different kind of ruler, a different kind of king, inaugurating a different kind of kingdom. A kingdom where power and humility are intermingled. Where, where the greatest of all actually came to be the servant of all. A kingdom where powerful kings ride in on teeny tiny donkeys. A kingdom that is not of this world. See, he's a different kind of king inaugurating a different kind of kingdom, which for a lot of people is very disappointing. And you know what the truth is? Still for some of us today, this is disappointing. We want a Jesus who rides in in power with guns blazing. We, we want a great and powerful king in the way that we understand earthly kings. But the fact that he's a different kind of king, inaugurating a different kind of kingdom, this is actually what makes him safe. This is what makes this promise to rule forever an okay promise. He's not like a tyrant or a dictator of the past. He's not holding on to power and using it against us. He didn't come to sit on a throne. He didn't even care who was in the palace. It didn't matter to him. Whoever was sitting on the thrones of the world, it had nothing to do. It wasn't going to get in the way of him fulfilling his agenda, which makes me wonder, why do we care so much about the people sitting on thrones, sitting in palaces, sitting in the halls of government? Why does it matter so much to us? I've had to say this a lot over the last few weeks, that as a church, we're apolitical. That means we don't care that much about politics, not because politics don't matter, but they just don't matter that much. We're here talking about something that matters so much more. If Jesus didn't ride to the palace to overthrow the government, that means there's something bigger that's now on the scene that, that means so much more than whoever's sitting in the halls of government. We have a kingdom of God agenda for our world, not a political one. And here's what you need to see, that, that as Jesus rode into the capital city that day and set into sequence, uh, set into motion, rather, a sequence of events that would unfold for the rest of the week, ultimately this would take him to a place where he would not ever be elevated to an earthly throne and a, and a jeweled crown set on his head, but he would be lifted up on a cross. And he'd be stripped naked, and a crown of thorns would be placed on his head, and he would offer up his life he, he would shed his blood as a peace offering for the entire world, for the sins of the entire world. Hear me on this. Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day to offer up his life, to shed his blood as an offering of peace for anyone who wants it so that anybody, no matter what, what tribe, nation, ethnicity, religion, or creed you belong to, would have the opportunity to enter into his reign, his kingdom of peace. See, I keep telling you he's a different kind of king, inaugurating a different kind of kingdom. It's a kingdom of peace. And although there will always be a Babylon and a Persia and a Greece and a Rome and, and all who came after, and, and we as people always have to learn how to contend with them because we're also still citizens of the world, citizens of the earth. We are simultaneously invited into something that is so much better, into this reign that extends over every kingdom, this, this other kingdom that, that is above every other earthly kingdom, that extends across all political borders, we're invited into something greater, this kingdom of peace where Jesus, this different kind of king, this king who would shed his blood for us, reigns forever. And you see, if you look at what Zechariah was saying, 500 years, 500 years before Jesus was even born, you'll see that this is exactly what he was describing. What will this king do? Why is he riding on a donkey? What does this mean? Well, he will proclaim peace to all nations. And his rule, not a political rule, but his reign, his reign of peace, his, his lordship will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth over, over every nation, right? And, and that's what we see happening. People from every tribe and nation, people all across this planet, together declare that Jesus is our king. And then he goes on and he says, and as for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, right? Because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you.
You see, when this king comes, he, he's, gonna, he's gonna come in a different way. He's, he's gonna shed his blood because of the blood of my covenant. What Zechariah is telling us 500 years before Jesus ever came onto the scene is that from the beginning, the cross was Jesus' plan that he never intended to go to a palace. Instead, he intended to shed his blood. He intended to offer up his life. He intended to give himself over into death so that we could be his. And, and his blood, his blood of the new covenant, the moment he shed his blood, that would be his coronation moment. That would be the moment that his reign was established and his rule is about freedom and it's about hope and it's about restoration. See, he will restore twice as much and that doesn't just mean that you know, you're conquered lands, but, but Jesus is saying that when he comes, he, he will restore everything that sin and death have taken from us. See, this is why this matters so much to receive this invitation from this king because when you allow him to be your king, he says no matter what happens, at the end of the day, I will restore everything that sin and death have cost you. I will restore you to life itself the way that God intended in the beginning. That's the promise that Jesus makes. This is the promise that every human being on earth is being invited into, regardless of where you live, regardless of who is governing over you. It's such a powerful promise. And the truth is that when you receive this promise, when you believe it to be true, when, when Jesus' blood, the blood of the covenant, covers you, and regardless of, of whatever political situation you're, li you're living in, you enter into his reign, his rule, then our whole identity changes, and, and the people who belong to his reign and rule, citizens of his kingdom, according to Zechariah, are now known as this. We are known as prisoners of hope. That's who we become, prisoners of hope. I love that phrase. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of challenging, isn't it? Prisoners of hope. That we, we've sung about this today already that when you come under the love of Jesus, you're free from every chain, every oppressor. Nothing can stand against him. No power can stand against you. You're free from everything except one thing. When you come under his kingdom, you are now a prisoner of hope. If you belong to Jesus, that's who you are. And hope, for the most part, sounds like a feel-good emotion, doesn't it? And it mostly is, but, but I'll tell you, hope ties your hands. And hope limits your options. Hope means, and being a prisoner of hope means, that I don't get to fall into cynicism and despair, even when everybody else is falling into cynicism and despair. I don't get to. It means I don't get to take matters into my own hands. I don't get to fight battles with worldly weapons. Remember, because he's come and he's taken my weapons away. Hope means that I trust in his power. I trust in his reign and rule, even when everything looks dark, when everyone else is saying things are hopeless, when all hope feels lost. I persevere in hope anyway. And, and you know what? I think this phrase, being a prisoner of hope, I think that describes exactly what I've been feeling so often over the last year. As, as I watch things in the world devolve, I watch things get chaotic, you know, everything from a, a world shutdown to a virus sweeping through the world, even in you know, the last couple of weeks going through my household and so many other people's households. Uh, worse is, is I watch how that's turned us on each other as I watch how people play dirty and get mean with each other, even within the family of God, even within the household of faith. I watch as the family of God, as, as we start to behave in ways that are far beneath, far beneath our dignity as God's children. And as I've been caught in the crossfire of some of that, there have been so many moments where I just wanna take up arms. I wanna fight. But Zechariah reminds me that now that I've come under this reign, now that I know Jesus, now that I've been invited under his blood, his sacrifice, I am now a prisoner of hope. Hope is my ball in chain. I don't have options except to be hopeful. And so often I don't want to be. I mean, I've recorded 33 hope updates since the pandemic began. These little 10 minute things trying to speak words of hope. In so many days, I didn't wanna speak hope. I wanted to speak frustration and anger. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to launch 
attacks back at people who were attacking. I wanted to go on the offensive. And, and maybe sometimes I did a little. But when you belong to Jesus, when you belong to his reign, when he extends it over you, here's the truth. We're prisoners of hope. That means no matter what, we always have to come back to hope. Because of Jesus, I know that I can't live life any other way. I'm a captive to hope. Hope is where I now must live. And that's not just me, of course. That's that's all of us. If you've, if you've received this invitation from Jesus, if you've let him extend his rule over you, then what this means is that you are now a prisoner of hope. Now, Peter, Peter was one of Jesus' closest followers. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day, Peter was right on his right hand. I mean, Peter was a follower of Jesus. And Peter was a guy who at one time was, was a warrior. He was ready to fight battles. A few days after Jesus rode in with the palm branches and the hosannas, Jesus was out hiding out in, in, in the garden outside of the city and a bunch of armed soldiers came to arrest him. Some of you know the story. And uh, they came to arrest him, to take him captive. And Peter saw this and he thought, no way. I mean, this, this is the king who's gonna take over and he's gonna lead our nation into victory. He can't get arrested, and so Peter takes a sword that he has on him. He draws a sword, and kind of as a shot over the bow, he cuts off the ear of one of the, of one of the soldiers. Peter's like, no, 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 this is not happening. We're, we're going to fight this, Jesus. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, what are you doing? Put away your sword. I, I didn't come for that. The world has enough swords of its own. See, Peter was a guy who who was all about the battle, was all about fighting. But over the course of Peter's life, he eventually got it that Jesus is a different kind of king. And he's extending a different kind of kingdom. And if we're part of that kingdom, we become different kind of people. And so later on, here's what Peter had to say. He wrote a couple of letters. And this is what he had to say to people like us, people who are living under the rule of the Babylons and the Persias and the, and the Greeces and the Romes of the world. Here's what he said. Here's what he spoke to us. He said, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? In other words, if you're doing good, most people won't even find fault with you, so, so do good. But even if you should suffer for what is right, even if you should suffer for doing good, remember this, you're blessed. And then he says this, do not fear their threats, the threats of those who can punish you. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts, remember who your real king is. Revere Christ as Lord. And not only that, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. See, Peter eventually got it. That once we come under the reign of Jesus, when he extends his rule over us, we're no longer people who pull out our weapons and, and we fight back. Instead, our only weapon is our testimony. It's a word of hope because we are prisoners of hope. See, Peter eventually got that Jesus was a different kind of king, inaugurating a different kind of kingdom. And today, my prayer for us is that we can remember that too, that we can be anchored that we can be captives, that, that hope again can be our ball and chain so that whatever is happening in the geopolitical world, we, we look at that and we say, so what? There's one who is reigning over us still and his peace extends over every tribe and nation, over every person and we are now captives, not of, of any foreign power, of, of any oppressor, but we are now captives of hope because he shed his blood, he set us free and he's inviting us into something better. See, see, he promises that no matter what is going on, he will rule and his rule is different. It is a good and loving rule. He will rule forever. And when he makes a promise, it's not an I do promise, it is an I will promise. He will keep his promise. 
Let me pray. God in heaven, I pray over all of us that you would tear down every stronghold in our lives, that you would destroy every oppressor, that you would break every chain, everything that binds us, everything that keeps us imprisoned, everything that holds us outside of your life, outside of your freedom. Set us free from everything that seeks to keep us chained up, imprisoned, uh, diminished, experiencing something less than your whole and full life. Except for one thing, Jesus, keep us imprisoned by your hope. Lord Jesus, anchor us again as your people in hope. I pray that you would cause us to put down our weapons, our worldly weapons, that we wouldn't feel the need to fight back in worldly ways, that we wouldn't feel the need to, to, to even care that much about what's going on in the political realms, that we would be so confident in who you are, in your power, in your goodness as a different kind of king, inaugurating a different kind of kingdom, that our hearts would live in peace and that we would be ambassadors, messengers, prisoners of hope. God, our world needs hope. And I pray that today you would do a work in us no matter how in despair we feel, no matter how frustrated we feel, how exhausted we feel. Anchor us, chain us again to the hope of Jesus, the hope that we have in him of one who loved us enough that he gave his life for us. The hope of a king who is so different, who comes not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for us. God, just, just take us captive to hope again that we might know the joy of living in hope, but, but, that, but that we might spread it around. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. You can help us grow our community by liking our content, sharing us on social media, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can also leave a comment if you felt inspired or you felt any kind of impact from today's service. We hope you have a great week. Thank you.